Et j'appelle tout de suite Madame Anne-Laurence Dupont, qui est chercheure au Centre de recherche sur la conservation des collections, docteur de, en chimie de l'Université d'Amsterdam et qui euh, mène actuellement des recherches sur la dégradation du papier et de la, et de la cellulose et euh, essaye de développer des nouveaux traitements, des nouvelles méthodologies de traitement pour euh, prolonger la vie de ces documents en papier. Elle va nous parler donc des effets des composés volatiles qui sont émis par le papier sur la dégradation de la cellulose ou en termes, je crois, un petit peu plus ludiques, comment le papier s'autodétruit. Oui. Merci beaucoup. <rire> euh, merci. Euh, tout d'abord, je vais m'excuser auprès des auditeurs français parce que j'ai prévu de faire euh, la conférence en anglais. Euh, donc, euh, I will start uh, with my presentation. Um, this is a collaborative project uh, with, uh, between CSSC and CCI. Um, there is a growing, well, there's been a growing interest in the issue of uh, volatile uh, compounds or, or interpollutants in museum libraries and archives um, uh, quite recently. And most of the recent research has been dedicated to identify and quantify Uh, the VOCs, mostly is volatile organic, organic compounds, uh, with a focus on aldehydes and organic acids, uh, including uh, the emissions that are produced by the, the paper collection themselves, which are the most, the main um, uh, source of emission uh, in storage rooms. And that includes um, our, our past research as well. Um, however, Uh, little is known um, about the effect or the impact of these uh, v VOCs or these volatile compounds um, on the collections. Um, there's some, um, some of our own research which, date, which dates back uh, from 2000 um, and more, more recently uh, there's been some effort into um, trying to, to evaluate and quantify these impacts. Uh, 2011. However, uh, when we started this, uh, this research, uh, the question, that was 2009, and uh, the question was uh, to know um, better uh, from, common, from the common uh, VOCs that are released by books and papers, uh, which ones are the most uh, reactive towards cellulose. So the aim of the research is to identify those volatile compounds that can induce or initiate deterioration in cellulose um, at room temperature and to simulate uh, the long-term effects uh, on the stability of paper through artificial aging. So that means that we focused um, on doing the exposures at ambient temperatures, unlike previous research that uh, was exposing uh, the papers to high temperatures and the volatiles at the same time. And this we did in order to observe, possibly observe, uh, damage in real time and also to avoid uh, initiating chemical processes that could uh, take place at elevated uh, temperatures. So we used, uh, we did our experimental uh, research with, uh, with model papers. Um, one is a very, two, two of the two papers are pure cellulose papers and one is a high degree of polymerization, long fibers, um, neutral pH, um, non-oxidized paper, which is what number one is very much used in paper research, and the other one is uh, Wattman 40, which is more acidic, uh, has a lower degree of polymerization, and a sizable um, oxidation uh, degree. Uh, the exposures uh, we did using uh, three uh, component systems, uh, classical with uh, water, salt, and the VOCs, in order to produce um, in the air a certain um, concentration of, of VOCs. And we use two, two different salts for that. Uh, to reach 54%, we use uh, magnesium nitrate, and uh, to reach 75%, uh, sodium chloride. And the exposure duration was 52 days. Uh, in phase one of the research, we focus on single exposures. We, we, we really only worked with one compound at a time. And these are the compounds that we listed. We chose them among common VOCs that, that we saw in the literature were produced by paper. So these are aldehyde uh, functions as well as acidic functions. And these are their concentrations together with the common, for some of them, for the acids are the 
um, common concentrations in rooms and in enclosures. So we were about um, 100 to 1,000 times above these concentrations. Uh, real situations are more complex because they, um, they, um, uh, they put into play um, several compounds at the same time, volatile compounds, which, which, are, which, which can be um, both absorbed and released by the paper. And they can also, uh, they, these can also involve air chemistry where new volatile compounds are produced. So in order to uh, better assess these complex situations and possibly evaluate antagonistic or synergistic effects between these compounds. In the second phase, we decided to do uh, multiple exposures where we mixed uh, two compounds. Um, among those that were identified in phase one as one very reactive compound and one less reactive compound. And this again at the concentration use, which always are lie between 20 and 80 uh, ppm. Um, so the, um, the equilibrium was reached uh, pretty quickly and was stable in two or five days. Uh, we had a stable environment. We couldn't find any acid formation in the aldehyde single um, solutions, which means that uh, aldehydes are not spontaneously uh, oxidizing into acids in our experiment. Uh, however, in some cases, we uh, noticed we had some air chemistry uh, going on. And the first one was that uh, we noticed that uh, you in, in the exposures at 54% RH, where we use magnesium nitrates, um, we uh, measured a release of nitrogen oxides, uh, which actually was produced by uh, the reaction of acids when we did the acid exposure with, uh, with, with the magnesium nitrate salt. We obtained up to uh, 10 ppm of nitrogen oxides in the case of formic acid, and this is what prompted us to redo a lot of the acid exposures at a different RH using uh, sodium chloride to avoid this problem. Um, the second case which we, we noticed uh, that was interesting chemistry going on in, uh, was with hydrogen peroxide, um, and this I will detail more here in this slide. Uh, in the desiccator where we uh, we exposed the papers to hydrogen peroxide at uh, 30%. Uh, we noticed first the first increase of, of hydrogen peroxide followed by a slow decrease. And concomitantly, uh, we could measure a, raise, a rise into, in the concentration of organic acids, up to 7 ppm. Uh, now when we added aldehyde in this mixture, uh, what happened is that um, Hydrogen peroxide was not detectable. We um, never could measure above one ppm. It was below the limit of detection of, of our uh, dragger tubes. Um, formaldehyde raised the concentration and then decreased pretty quickly while we, f we, we measured um, a high production of formic acid. So in order to better understand the chemistry what was, that was going on here, we did a third experiment where we avoid having paper, we had an empty uh, desiccator only with uh, the two volatile compounds, and we basically observed the same chemistry with formation of formaldehyde, slow formation, decay, and uh, formation of formic acid, but it was only slower. Um, so this told us that uh, oxidation of formaldehyde to formic acid by the hydrogen peroxide occurred in the air. Well, this is uh, liquid chemistry, this is uh, pretty obvious, but that hadn't been really, um, as far as we know, um, um, demonstrated in the air. And um, the presence of the paper contributed to a faster and higher uh, conversion yield of uh, formaldehyde into formic acid. So that indicates that there's either um, surface chemistry or degradation chemistry uh, going on. Uh, after the, uh, these exposures, we dissolved the paper for 10 days, hoping that uh, we would uh, dissolve completely the volatile compounds from the, from the paper, and we did uh, accelerated aging, hydrothermal aging, uh, using the ACM standard method um, in closed tubes at 100 degrees, and this we did for 5 and, and 10 days. The measurements that we did, uh, pretty classical uh, measurements pa in paper science, uh, degree of polymerization, uh, which we did either using cells exclusion chromatography with multi-angular scattering detection, which uh, provides uh, the absolute values for the degree of the number average 
degree of polymerization and the weight average degree of polymerization. And we also did viscometry because sometimes it was just easier and uh, to obtain a viscometric degree of polymerization. Well, these two values for um, pure cellulose papers are reported to be very close uh, in the literature. It's indeed what we found. So um, uh, we, in, in the results, I will indiscriminately um, use these values and call it TP. Uh, copper number was measured as well. Um, copper number is an um, index for um, uh, compounds of functions in cellulose, on cellulose or in paper, uh, which have reducing properties. And these are mostly carbonyl uh, functions. Um, what we did is uh, we um, related the value that we measured on, on copper number to the total carbonyl uh, uh, functions in cellulose using a um, linear relationship that was determined determined by rolling. We also did pH measurements, um, breaking length measurements, the yellowing index, but I will not uh, talk about these results uh, today. So these are, uh, are the results. Um, with these bar graphs, which show um, for the single exposures the, um, the effect uh, on Wattman paper number one. I will not talk about Wattman 40, uh, and I will refer you to uh, our publication, uh, which, has been, um, which has been published recently, uh, to find out more of, of these results. So uh, the results showed that um, it was uh, mostly formic acid and hydrogen peroxide, which had a huge effect on the degree of polymerization uh, of cellulose with a big decrease uh, in real time in 52 days. Uh, for hydrogen peroxide, well, it is known that it is non-selective oxidant for cellulose, so, and it also uh, promotes uh, oxidative depolymerization. So this is, uh, this is in accordance to this uh, general um, knowledge of hydrogen peroxide in, in, liquid, uh, in liquid phases. Uh, with acetic acid, uh, we were surprised that we didn't get much degradation here, whether it was a 54% or 75% relative humidity. Um, so uh, this was one of our surprises. Um, the aldehydes, on the other hand, did not have any impact. See that uh, there is no degradation induced by the exposures to all the aldehydes. Uh, the aging, the post-exposure aging at 100 degrees uh, confirms and accentuates uh, the degradation initiated that we, we measured uh, during the exposures. Uh, with, uh, st we start to see some degradation uh, with the acetic acid exposures, as well as with some of the aldehyde exposures. We have a small decrease here. Uh, otherwise, what is uh, also striking is the effect of formaldehyde. Uh, which seems to have some um, protective effect during the accelerated aging, which the DP is by 20% uh, uh, higher than that of the control sample. Um, well, we don't have a um, definite explanation to that. Uh, it's been observed before in other materials. Um, we, can, we, we can think of uh, formaldehyde being uh, absorbed in the fibers and maybe weakly bonded and, and shielding some, somehow shielding the reactive functions or the reactive sites on cellulose such as hydroxyl groups and glycosidic bonds. Um, that's our explanation for now, but this needs, of course, more, more, uh, more research. Uh, the results of the multiple uh, volatile compound exposures, uh, the following. Uh, as I said before, uh, we found trace uh, NOx in uh, the exposures of acetic acid in some cases. And in those specific cases, we could measure uh, some more degradation than when NOx was not present in the acetic acid desiccator, which we attributed to the uh, nitrogen oxide's uh, presence. Uh, interestingly, in the, when acetaldehyde was present together with acetic acid, we also uh, measured the release of NOx, and which was actually larger than, uh, it was 3 ppm in that case, but uh, we observed that degradation was much lower and was uh, almost the same as with acetic acid alone. So um, 
it seems that uh, staldehyde seems to operate an antagonistic effect uh, on the degradation induced. And uh, this is actually uh, even more um, visible with the mixture of formaldehyde and formic acid. We have uh, a much uh, larger uh, effect in, uh, in the beneficial effect of the presence of formaldehyde uh, compared to the degradation we observed with formic acid. Um, with hydrogen peroxide as well, uh, the presence of formaldehyde induced less degradation, although this is relative. We, we know that uh, in that desiccator, formic acid was produced, so this is degradation induced by formic acid, but also by the residual hydrogen peroxide that is, was in there, was really in trace levels. So this residual um, uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, content is really uh, is really damaging if we compare to the, the damage we observed with formic acid alone. Um, upon aging, again, we observe the same uh, tendencies, uh, confirming uh, what we had observed in the real exposures, real-time exposures, and accentuating the degradation um, uh, with time. Uh, these, are, these are the results for, um, for the oxidation, and this is uh, really the oxidation on the cellulose chains, uh, excluding the reducing end uh, aldehyde that you can measure with a, with a copper number, we excluded that part. So we see that basically um, there's little oxidation, including formic acid, um, that, well, that is consistent with the action of, of an acid which promotes mostly hydrolysis, acid hydrolysis. Uh, however, uh, for the uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, we, we measured uh, a lot of, um, of oxidation, which is also consistent with the action of hydrogen peroxide. Um, for all other compounds, there was little oxidation, more, li more or less consistent with, uh, with the depolymerization we had measured uh, earlier. This is upon aging of the samples, where we observe that basically the, the hydrothermal aging has uh, increased oxidation in all of the samples, uh, especially uh, in the case of formic acid. Uh, however, we still see this antagonistic effect of the presence of the aldehydes uh, in the case of formaldehyde with formic acid, and also in the case of, of acetic acid and acetaldehyde. Uh, again, it's not worthy that uh, the exposures to formaldehyde uh, actually led to less oxidation than what was observed for the control sample. So this uh, table here summarizes the results in terms of numbers uh, with uh, the real-time exposure here, this, the two results, DP and CO, and the age, uh, five days aged uh, samples. So what we see basically with the presence of, uh, in terms of numbers uh, of formaldehyde in the mixture with uh, hydrogen peroxide is a decrease in the difference degree of polymerization. We're talking here in percent uh, compared to um, the control sample that wasn't exposed to the, to the volatile compound. And a decrease also in the carbonyl com content. For formic acid, basically the same observation, but even uh, more strikingly, uh, since we didn't observe any degradation at all um, when formaldehyde was present uh, during the time of the exposure. Um, with acetic acid, presence of NOx that increases the degradation, whereas again, the presence of the aldehyde seems to reduce uh, the uh, degradation and for the aldehydes, basically no degradation time, and in during the exposure time, some degradation upon aging, starting degradation, and even the higher, um, um, the protective effect of formaldehyde here, 12% after aging at five days. So the conclusions uh, are manifold. Uh, First of all, that hydrogen peroxide was by far uh, the most harmful volatile compound. And uh, 
considerably increase both hydrolysis and oxidation at ambient temperature during the 52 days exposures. Um, formic acid also led to considerable uh, acid hydrolysis, although no oxidation in real time. Uh, this came with the hypothermal aging. Acetic acid and the aldehydes uh, induced little to no degradation, uh, and some hydrolytic degradation was noticed upon aging, especially with acetic acid, but also with sulfur and hexanol. Uh, nitrogen oxide are responsible for hydrolysis and some oxidation, and, and I like to point out here that the concentrations of nitrogen oxide that, that were present were very, very low, uh, almost uh, more like maybe one to ten times, ten times what, what can be uh, found in indoor air. So um, this is really to, to be careful about, but this is known. Aldehydes uh, reduced the deterioration caused by most, the most reactive volatile compounds, so that's an interesting result. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, hydrogen peroxide reacts with uh, aldehydes to produce acids, uh, which are the also uh, very reactive, although less than the hydrogen peroxide itself. So the risk for the preservation of paper-based collections, uh, first of all, well, formic acid, as you know, can be, uh, can be emitted by some some products, uh, containers, uh, wood, uh, paint, and glues in, uh, in rooms, so that, that, is, uh, that is something, uh, that's why we included it, of course. Nitrogen oxide from infiltration of outdoor air, mostly, into the building, and can affect, can be damaging if documents are unprotected. And acetic acid should not be overlooked, in my opinion, because even though the degradation was much smaller than we would have anticipated uh, from past research, um, it's present in larger concentrations in indoors than formic acid. And of course, we have to point out again that these are short time exposures. We did that in 52 days. So you have to think about longer exposures that can have a much uh, larger uh, degradation effect. So to finish up on our future work, and this is uh, mostly the focus of, uh, of my co-author, uh, Jean Tetro from CCI, uh, and of his work these past years, is to, will be to study the dose response a little more closely um, of, uh, of paper and VOCs, and try to define a critical uh, adverse effect, what he calls the lower ed. And for instance, with our data, uh, this law ahead, if we take the example of formic acid, would be uh, if we consider, uh, for instance, that this effect, this critical effect, if we set it at 5% dp, but this is of course arbitrary, it's an example, uh, then we reach a lower head of 690 ppb a year. Another way of looking at this is to try to uh, define a critical adverse effect with a critical dp value that, would, that could be reached. Uh, in that case, we can define a critical dp value if we consider the relationship between mechanical properties and uh, degree of polymerization. And this is uh, the relationship for all of our samples exposed or unexposed, aged and unaged. And this is a relationship that is known, it's been published before. Um, so uh, if we take the critical dp, uh, we can define it as the cross-section between these two tangent lines, where uh, additional degradation, uh, additional decrease in degree of polymerization will have a higher impact on the mechanical properties. This is breaking length, but this has been observed also with other uh, mechanical properties. Um, and ultimately, the mechanical strength is uh, the property that defines the usability of paper and is, is something that, uh, that can, everyone can relate to. So in our case, we could define it in the range 1,400, uh, which in that case we could define um, a value for lower head of 9 ppm year to reach that uh, critical value or, or 7.5 to 10.8. And with this, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention.
Merci beaucoup, madame. Voilà qui, qui promet de grandes choses pour la, la préservation des papiers et la, la, la connaissance de, ou l'apprentissage plutôt et la mise en œuvre de, de nouvelles méthodes pour préserver les papiers dont nous avons la, la responsabilité. Est-ce que nous avons, nous avons, je pense que nous avons le temps pour une ou deux questions D'accord. Ah bon, nous regrouperons les questions alors à la fin de la séance. Alors, juste une seule question, monsieur le directeur. Thank you very much for that interesting presentation. I have uh, one question in particular, which is about the um, presence of hydrogen peroxide. Is this uh, a component you're using in the experiment primarily to um, introduce the fact that there are peroxides in the air, or are you suggesting it's from residual treatment of paper with per hydrogen peroxide? Was maybe um, no. We, the primary reason why we use hydrogen peroxide was to see if we could, if you, we could convert formaldehyde to formic acid. We, we, it was to observe the chemistry, basically. Uh, now it's not to say that there's no hydrogen peroxide either in uh, in context of of paper boxes or storage. It's never been definitely. Um, identified as far as I know. There's been indirect proof that sometimes associated with uh, iron gold ink papers. Uh, there could be uh, degradation could induce at some point um, hydrogen peroxide in the cycle. So it's, it's not uh, something that is absent completely. It can be present. And uh, the, the fact that it's so reactive at very, very low concentration is, all, is of course of, a, of concern. Merci beaucoup, madame.